Good evening, everyone. It's good that you can join us. Tonight we're having another Q&A session and we'll also be hearing from Nathan later on for our sermon. And this should be, Lord willing, our last recorded service and then we'll be meeting back in person next week, which we're all looking forward to. So we'll jump straight into the questions. We've got about five and they're pretty big, so we, we better move quickly. So first question, do miraculous gifts, like in the New Testament, such as tongues, healing and prophecy, occur today? We go far away. <laughs> All right, I, I'll, I'll kick us off and um, then hand over to you. I, I, and we haven't really talked about this, so hopefully we, we land on the same ground. <laughs> it's a really difficult question in the sense that there is quite a strong argument uh, for the gifts to have ceased. So in 1 Corinthians 13, uh, the Apostle Paul writes and talks about the fact that when perfection comes, these things will fade away. So there are some who would argue that what he means about that, when perfection comes, is perfection is the completion of the word of God. And therefore, the need for the charismatic gifts, tongues, prophecy, miracles, uh, and so on, have now ceased to exist. So if you take someone like John MacArthur, he takes that position where those spectacular gifts have come to an end. Out of all the positions, it's the easiest to take. It's the least messy because you can just rule it out straight away. And it makes church life very easy to be able to go with. But I'm not convinced that that necessarily is the right way of understanding that passage. I'm not sure when he talks about perfection that he's actually talking about scripture coming to an end. But perfection being when Christ comes and wraps up history and then we enter into the uh, heavenly age. So I, th I think that those charismatic gifts still apply today but i think they don't necessarily apply the way that they've sometimes been understood in the charismatic world mm. so if we were to take just a, a couple of those uh, if you take the gift of tongues for example um, i think scripture is very clear in terms of the word that is used glossolalia for tongues in the in the original language the way that the that is used in Paul, uh, not Paul, sorry, in Acts when they speak about the people speaking in strange tongues. Uh, it's used to refer to known languages. And so when Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 14, I've spoken in tongues more than anyone else in verses 1 and 2, it's not that Paul is saying I've spoken in some ecstatic language more than anyone else. What Paul is saying is that I speak in a whole range of languages. And if you know anything about the Apostle Paul, you know he spoke Hebrew, he spoke Greek, he spoke Aramaic. So there were a number of languages that, that he spoke already. So when he talks about in 1 Corinthians 14 particularly about the gift of tongues coming uh, to the congregation. Interestingly, he says it's a sign for unbelievers, not for believers. And so he talks about the fact that when unbelievers come in, if there's this chaotic, ecstatic kind of speech happening where no one understands what's going on, the unbeliever is going to stand up and he's going to get up and he's going to walk out. And so there's no meaning or witness to that being for unbelievers. However, if an unbeliever walks in, let's say, into a congregation like ours, that is an English-speaking congregation, who comes from Argentina and only speaks Spanish and doesn't have any understanding of English, and then someone in the congregation gets up and brings a word in Spanish, a language not learned by them, and that person then understands, and there's interpretation brought for the rest of the congregation, so all of us understand mm. what has been said in Spanish. My understanding is that's how tongues works. So in, in our modern context, it's very rare that that would ever occur. And there have been some recorded instances of exactly that happening in a church. If you were to take the gift of prophecy, for example, I'm not convinced prophecy is about someone standing up and saying, well, I'm telling you about the future and God has revealed this to me because the prophetic word that comes more often than not in scripture is a foretelling of God's word. And so I think my understanding of prophecy is that it is grounded mainly in the prophetic utterance of the word of God. So that comes forward either in preaching primarily, where as the preacher preaches, there is an element of the prophetic in the preaching. And it may come also in someone engaging one-on-one -on -one discipleship, where they bring a word of God that is prophetically speaking into the life of the person to whom they are, are discipling. I'm not convinced that it's someone who just gets up and says, ah, oh, I've got a word. Uh, someone is suffering from a backache in the congregation and God's going to heal you from the, the, the backache. I don't think that's the way prophecy is understood. If you take healing, for example, 
The interesting thing again there is that the word that is used is in the plural in the original language. So it's not the gift of healing, singular, but the gift of healings, plural. So my understanding again of that is that what, what, what's going on there is Paul is saying it's not so much a gift confined to a particular person who has the gift of healing and goes around and performs healing services wherever they go. But rather, God from time to time may move in a spectacular, miraculous way mm. upon a particular believer who prays for someone. And at that particular point in time, as they pray for healing, God divinely uses them to heal that person. So it's not necessarily a gift that resides with a person, but a gift that may come temporarily to a person on any given occasion. Does healing happen? Of course it does. But does it happen often? My experience of 25, 30 odd years of ministry is no, it doesn't happen often, but it does still occur. So yes, I think those gifts still operate, but I think they operate within a specific context and that they uh, need to be careful that you don't abuse them and make them say something that scripture is not saying. Hmm. Uh, you guys are welcome to answer uh, that. <laughs> no, it's good. You've defined, like you have to define the gifts in that question to answer hmm. it, and then you've got to see whether they still continue on. So you did that well. And I, I think as well, I agree with 1 Corinthians 13 there when he uses phrases, phrases like, the perfect will come, uh, will see face to face. Yep. It seems to be pointing more to the second coming yeah. and the kingdom mm. that will come then, not to God's word being perfected and finished. Um, so, yeah, I think you hit it, hit it right there with the... Yeah, mm. and I think too, I guess, if we see that the gifts cease, we can sometimes limit God even yeah. and box him in to certain yeah. rules that we probably shouldn't. So I feel that too, yep. yeah. Yeah, that's good. Agree. Very thorough. Thank Excellent. Well, the next question, how can we be confident in the canon and the inerrancy of scripture wasn't the canon simply selected by a group of men who made their own fallible decisions about what was in and what was out so a question focused on why do we have the bible that we have now in these particular books and these collection of books um nathan did you want to start with any comments probably just uh just defining what the canon is this is this is all 66 books of, of scripture. So when we talk about the canon, mm. we're talking about Genesis to Revelation. How did how did those 66 books come into being? How did we determine that was the Bible? Mm. And so that is the canon, nothing else yet. So that's helpful for identifying. Yeah, um, yeah the, the question is spot on because it was the, with the New Testament there, the, these books were uh, selected by... Uh, the early church as it were so they did determine what went in and uh what didn't go in uh but even though it was i think it's third century mm. fourth, cent fourth century fourth when century. It, fourth century when it did get selected um we need to remember that it wasn't that the christians were without a new testament kind of leading up to that point uh most of the new testament books were already circulated mm. and were already held mm. by the church at that time they were read mm. read throughout all the churches um What's interesting is why the canon was put together, and that's because of the heretic Marcinian mm. who came about and he thought he didn't like the Old Testament God, and so he, uh, he thought he was too angry and Jesus revealed God truly, so he sought to cut and paste all the passages in the New Testament that seemed to represent God like the Old Testament God, and he really edited the Bible. And mm. the Christians, uh, the early church said, hey, this is heresy, this is wrong. And really they gathered those mm. uh, letters that were circulated already. Mm. Um, and then they had a very thorough process of how mm. how they chose the New Testament. It, yeah. So some of those things being, was it written by an apostle? If it wasn't written by an apostle, was it sanctioned by an apostle? Did it have apostles overseeing, overseeing mm. the letter? Um, things like that. So there was a very careful process because mm. a lot of letters that got rejected came from the Gnostic heretics mm. and they were very easy to spot. So mm. uh, I think we should have confidence that anything yeah. you guys want to add. I guess, yeah, like an important recognizing they weren't picking out the books at that point. Those books had already been recognized by the church, early churches because of the yep. apostles writing it, because of their consistency and what they were teaching with the rest of the Bible and the Old Testament. Mm. Um, and because as well, churches were all accepting them as God's word. And so because yes. of that, they already were being accepted as books. So when the councils, I guess, came and met, they weren't picking out the books and claiming, yeah, these are God's word. These are the ones we're going to put in the Bible. They were just recognizing what God had already worked yeah. and the ones that God had already picked out and shown that they were his word. And mm -hmm. the early church had really recognized that already. So I think that's yeah, quite true. key. Sometimes we look at the councils and think they're just picking out the books and they're deciding which ones are God's word. 
Mm. But that, that had already become evident mm. in history. Yeah, I think if I can just very, very briefly pick up on your mm. point, it's, it's a recognition. It's mm. not a deciding what is and isn't in that sense, but mm. it's just a recognition that these are the accepted That's books it. that are, are, are in use. And then there was a number of criteria. Is it inspired? Mm. Is it inerrant? Does it agree mm. with all the other scriptures? Are there contradictions between mm. these books? Which is why some of the Catholic books were not included because there were some internal contradictions within those books mm. that made it impossible for them to be in agreement with the rest of scripture. So there's the internal witness, there's the external witness. How many manuscripts do we have? Are, mm. Is there agreement between the manuscripts mm. regarding the material that is being used and so on? So those criteria were strictly adhered to and I think mm. that uh, enable them to make some decisions that were um, result in the New Testament. Mm. Yeah, you can see the differences with the Apocrypha. Yeah. It, yeah. it, it doesn't match up to the no. Gospels. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, excellent, yeah. Well, the next question takes a shift. Now, the theology of predestination says that before a person is born, God chooses whether they will be saved or sent to hell, and that Jesus died only for the elect. How is this consistent with a few passages? John 3, 16, whoever believes in him shall not perish. 1 Timothy 2, 4, who wants all people to be saved. Uh, 2 Peter 3, 9, God doesn't want any to perish. And 1, uh, 1 John 2, 2, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and also for the sins of the whole world. Do you want to kick us off an hour? Yeah. Um, I think... One of the things that uh, Christians struggle with, the, the concept of predestination, um, as if it's kind of a new teaching that suddenly seems to pop up in the New Testament. Um, but when you, when you look carefully at the Old Testament, I think, we, I think the uh, Old Testament is even more shocking because when you, when you think at God's working in the Old Testament, out of all the nations, all the people in the world, God chose one to reveal himself. Um, so one small nation in comparison to the world that he revealed his glory personally, he revealed his name, his commandments, his will. Now they were to be a light to the rest of the nations, but um, th by the time that Israel got their act together and the word started going out, there were many generations that died without a knowledge of, of Yahweh at all, his commands or anything. So predestination is very prominent in the Old Testament, prominent with Jacob and Esau when they're both in the womb. You know, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated before either of them have done anything and my purposes will stand through Jacob. Um, and then Paul obviously picks up on that. So I think that's helpful to recognize it's grounded. This has always been God, God's way of acting, not just a New Testament reaction. Mm. Maybe we're misreading um, mm. Paul. Jesus picks up on it with the parables. He conceals, he conceals the meaning from many. He almost speaks in riddles and then he privately explains them to the disciples. Um, mm. So we see it coming through there. Mm. Um, and then we get verses like this that seem to, um, the one that I hear the most objection is probably John 3, 16. Yeah. Um, I guess what's interesting with the Greek is uh, people say, you know, for God so loved us, so that whoever believes, and they emphasize the whoever. But in the Greek, mm. all it says is that all the believing ones will not perish. There's nothing contradicting to predestination there. Mm. Whoever, all, all the believing ones will not perish. That's, that's what people who hold mm. the predestination believe. So probably mm. just to kick us off, I think that's mm. just getting that one out of the way, which is probably the most prominent mm. objection. Uh, yeah. Definitely, yeah. I, I think, yeah, I, I'd like to say that in a sense, the premise of the question is, is uh, probably faulty. And the reason I say that is because in the question, if I can just read it, it says, um, whether they will be saved or sent to hell, there is no predestination to hell. So scripture never talks about those being predestined to hell. It talks about those being predestined to heaven. And it talks about those who reject the offer of salvation being sent to hell. So I think we must be careful of not having a double predestination here. There is no such thing in scripture. Uh, I think in terms of the, the predestination problem that people have, if I can try and highlight mm. it, is they cannot understand why God should choose some and not everyone. From a human perspective, it seems as though God is being unjust or being unfair. Mm. And I think God uh, picks that up when Paul writes to the Romans and he says, you know, uh, one of you will say to me, oh, you're not being unjust. I mean, how can you say you loved one and you hated the other? Mm. And God's response to that, who are you a man to talk back to God? Mm. Shall what mm. is formed say to the potter how he should form it? So mm. in a sense, God says, this is not a matter of justice for you in your own human conception to decide whether this is fair or not. 
this is what I've determined and, and regardless of what you think, uh, you don't have, have the ability and the knowledge and the understanding and the insight to be able to question my wisdom and how I've uh, gone about saving people. Mm -hmm. I, I think in terms of the, the scriptures that are quoted, I, I mean, these are, are commonly quoted, so there's nothing surprising here. Uh, I think you need to distinguish between the uh, sovereign will of God and the permissive will of God, if I can put it like that. And you need to determine between the sufficiency of God's grace and the effectiveness of God's grace. And I think there is a difference. So when God says he wants all people to be saved, that is an expression of God's desire. It is an expression of God's moral will. But you and I both know we can break God's moral will. Mm. God says, do not murder. We have people who murder. God says, do not steal. It's God's desire that people don't murder, don't steal, and yet people steal and people mm. murder. So when God says he desires that all men to save, it is God's moral will to see everyone be saved. But at the end of the day, the ones who are saved effectively are only those who come to faith as a result of God's choice of them uh, prior to them making any kind of decision. Now, you know, so when you get to a, a text like Timothy, 1 Timothy 2, 4, who wants all people to be saved, that is an expression of God's moral will. If you go to 1 John 2, 2, he is atoning sacrifice for our sins and also the sins of the whole world. Now, what you've got to understand there is John is saying there is only one savior for the world. There's only one way you get saved, and that's through Jesus Christ. So if Jesus Christ is the sacrifice for our sins as our believers, he's also the only way that unbelievers are going to be saved. He's not saying that unbelievers are going to, uh, when he says the sins of the whole world, that Jesus has died for everyone in the whole world. But what he is saying mm. is Jesus is the only sacrifice for the sins of everyone in the world. So if anyone is going to be saved, the only way they're going to be saved is through trusting in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, mm. 2 Peter 3, 9. Not, it is God's will that none should perish, but all should come to repentance and faith. And again, it is God's expression of his, his, his will that all, his moral will that all are saved, but not all do are saved. Uh, unfortunately, mm. some resist God's, God's uh, overtures of grace towards them. So I think we need to just understand the difference between God's desires and God's effective will. And there is a, is a great difference. Uh, the other thing I'd, I'd want people to wrestle through or think through is if God wants all people to be saved and clearly not everyone is saved then either Christ has failed in accomplishing salvation on the cross or salvation becomes a work by which I secure it through my decision and and that becomes the clinching factor in it mm. But if Christ actually saves on the cross, if when he says it is finished, and he means it is finished, and what is finished, I've come down not to do the will of him who sent me, but to, uh, I've not come down to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up on the last day, John 6. Mm. If that's what Jesus utters in John 6, and then says on the cross, it is finished, either it's finished or it's not, if it's finished, then he has secured the salvation of all for whom he has died on the cross. And if he has secured their salvation on the cross, then inevitably it must mean that those who he has secured on the cross to be saved have been predestined by God. And so God the Father says to him, uh, you shall lose none of all that I have given you. God has given him those mm. whom he will save on the cross and jesus saves them and the way in which he saves them is through his death on the cross if he doesn't save them then his death is a failure mm. then he cannot secure the salvation of those whom god has given him and that is a contradiction in term and then you have this this contradiction between the trinity because you've got on the one hand god the father who elects the people Jesus Christ who saves them and the Holy Spirit who effects that salvation. Now you've got a problem. God's elected them. Christ can't save them. Neither can the Holy Spirit effect their salvation. Mm -hmm. But in, in understanding predestination, if God has selected a group of people, Christ then pays the penalty for this and he actually saves them. It's an effective death. And the Holy Spirit then applies that salvation in their lives. Mm. And so you have the Trinity working together with each other in conformity mm. with, uh, w w with the plan of salvation and the purpose of salvation. Um, so yeah. it, it, to, to my mind, it's logically impossible <coughs> to be able to say on the, in one breath, God 
effects God actually saves, and then on the other breath to say that uh, uh, it, it, those who are not saved, or, or rather to say in the other breath, God wants people to be saved but can't actually save them. Mm. Either he saves them or he doesn't. Mm. Either he's effective or he's not. Uh, but you can't have it both ways. Mm. And, and I think scripture is very clear that when it comes to the purpose of salvation, God accomplishes exactly what he sets out to do uh, mm. for, for all those whom he has predestined uh, to be saved. Sorry, mm. you guys, please, please add to no, that. No, that's good. I think it's important to recognize script, scripture is clear, like you said. It's, it doesn't make it any easier, though. I think you can tell behind the question, too. It's a hard thing to accept. It is. Mm. It's not easy. And, but that, and I think that's partly because of our view of God is too small. Mm. Coming back to Romans 9 and some of that big view of God's given mm. there. He's the potter, we're the clay, and... Yeah. We need to realize that as well as our view of sin is small because we don't see the wrong we've done against God and what we deserve, that we don't deserve anything. We don't deserve to be saved. We should be in hell mm. immediately. And yeah. even I think our understanding is we, we want to try and put neat rules on God's sovereignty and, and, he, and our responsibility and our need to believe. But the Bible doesn't give neat rules for that. It says both of them mm. and it doesn't really answer the com complexities of how they work together. So mm. it's important to, to realize that. Even, I guess, as well, recognizing the, I, I always find in predestination, it's actually a comforting thing to know. It is. I think some people always see it as such a harsh, hard thing. But if we leave it up to people's uh, ability to believe, how can we have confidence that anyone can be saved? Like people mm. that have rejected God for decades that I know, I can't be confident that they're going to be saved if it, if it depends wholly on them believing and turning mm. to him. But if it Absolutely. depends on God, who can break the hardest of hearts, then there is a a great confidence that they can be saved. So it's actually a comforting thing, even yeah. though we don't often view it like that. Mm, absolutely. But it's important to remember. Mm. All right, we might have to wrap it yeah. there. We had a couple more questions, um, but they're, they're pretty meaty ones. So we'll end it there. Uh, please stick around though. We're about to hear from Nathan. Well, it's now uh, time for us to uh, jump into the sermon this evening. As we are on holidays, we are still having a break from going through the book of Joshua. Uh, so tonight I want to take the time uh, to look at uh, the subject of the second coming and what the scriptures say about preparing for the second coming. So if you have your Bible, I would encourage you, please turn to Romans uh, chapter 13. Romans chapter 13, uh, we're going to read from verse 8 to 14. Uh, but I'm only going to be focusing uh, from verses 11 to 14. But we'll read from verse 8 to just get the context. Verse 8. Let no debt remain outstanding except for the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. The commandments do not murder do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not covet, and whatever other commandment there may be are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this understanding the present time. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Let's pray uh, before we jump into this passage. Our Father, we come before you and we really just want to thank you for this time that we have, uh, our last online, as it were, before we can reopen up. Uh, we want to thank you for the provision that you have given us all of these months. Father, we thank you that we can have your uh, infallible word opened opened up now we thank you that we uh, live in such a place where we can have bibles freely before us to consider and to read and to study 
Um, But now, God, we thank you. You have uh, directed us to this text, and we pray that your spirit would be opening it up to us, illuminating it. And God, we pray, as the psalmist prays, revive us according to your word. Give us life according to your word. We need the Holy Spirit's help for this. We pray that you'd help us to grasp the context of what's going on here, the reality of all that is to come. And God, may we feel a tremendous weight of importance to all of this. Please, God, take our eyes and, Lord, lift them heaven, would we pray. And and most of all, we ask in this time that Christ would be glorified. He is the head of the church, the Lord of the church. And we pray that he would be honored as his word is expounded. The message about him is proclaimed. So may he be honored in all that we say and do and think tonight. And we ask it for his sake. Amen. Well, here, if you look at verse uh, 11, where I really want us to focus tonight, uh, Paul says, and do this, understanding the present time. And and do what? Well, again, th- this is where verses 8, uh, 8 to 10 are the context. He's encouraging these Christians to fulfill the law of love. The commandments that God has given us are summed up in loving one another all of it do not murder do not cover all of that is uh, loving one another not doing harm to one another and and this is really what he has been focusing on for the last chapter and a half uh, the christian's duty to love one another but now he brings it into a another context here and we see it in light uh, of what is ahead in the future so the first point i want us to see tonight is the christians need to wake up The Christians need to wake up. Look at verse 11 with me. And do this understanding the present time. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. Paul here mentions the present time or the hour has come. And he says, understand the present time. Understand that the hour has come. What what is this present time? What is this hour referring to? Well, that Greek word chiron there for present time hour here is referring to a particular period, a significant moment, an aeon of time, an era of time, even a moment of crisis. Paul here is talking about the end of history. He's talking about the end of the age. He's talking about Jesus' return. All of this is brought on by the return of Christ. And and this is obvious at the end of the verse where Paul says, our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. Now, our salvation is split up into parts, as it were. When we believe in Christ, in that moment, we are saved. We've moved from death to life. But we don't experience the fullness of that salvation till Christ returns when he takes us to be with him, when what is mortal is clothed with immortality and where we are glorified with Christ. So he says our salvation, this full, the full work uh, that we partake of is very near. Paul is really pressing Christians here to to take in this reality. And he's saying, do you understand, Christian, that we are living in the last days? We are living in the last era. Now, you cannot understand, you cannot function as a healthy Christian unless you comprehend and understand that we are living in the last times. Not something that just happened post-2000. But since Christ's death, resurrection, and ascension, we have been living in the end times, the end period. And Paul is saying the last key event on God's prophetic calendar, the last key event is Christ coming back. And when he comes back, he will usher in the moment of judgment day. And when he comes back, there will be the bringing in of the new heavens and the new earth. This is the final event that we're waiting. And he's saying it's coming. So what is Paul's instruction uh, for Christians in light of Jesus' imminent return, in light of the present time? The end of verse 11, he says, The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber. He's saying it's time to wake up from your sleep, Christian. 
Now, this draws allusions to Jesus' parable of the ten virgins. You will remember the ten virgins, they're all waiting for Jesus to return. They're waiting for the groom to come back. They're all looking for the groom. They all go out waiting for him, but all ten of them fall asleep. And then when the groom does come back, all ten awake and only five of them, only half of them are admitted entrance. And really behind that parable, there's a bit of a flavor to it that even the Christians are caught off guard at Christ's return. They weren't fully prepared as it were. They grew drowsy. So Paul tells Christians to wake up from their sleep. Now, what is this sleep? Well, sleep in the physical realm, in the physical sense, is that time in bed where we switch off, where we let our guard down, where we, uh, our consciousness is almost uh, inactive, as it were. And things around us could be happening, ambulances could be going past, there could be chaos outside, and yet we could be completely oblivious to it because we're shut off from the world. Our response is down. And Paul uses that imagery of, our, of how we are when we're sleeping and he applies it to the Christian life that Christians are in danger of this spiritual sleep for our spiritual lives to be like this where we are disengaged, we're in a, in a kind of coma state where we're inactive, where we're unresponsive and our guard is down. And Paul commands us, it's time to wake up. It's time to wake up. And what does, this, what does this Christian sleep look like? Well, Paul here is talking about the great sin of apathy, the great sin of indifference. Jesus is on the way, and yet that reality changes nothing for us so much of the time. Indifference and apathy in our Christian walk. Think about it. How many times do we hear a sermon and the word cuts to our heart and we think, ouch, things aren't right with me. I'm not in a good place. I'm not doing well. I'm drifting. I'm cold I'm, or I'm lukewarm. And then after we hear that, nothing, no application, no thought, no taking to heart, no prayerful pleading to God after we hear these things. And we go straight back to the old path. Apathy and indifference in our Christian walk. Here's a scary task. Why don't you go and ask other church members of the congregation and ask them, how often do you read God's word? How often are you reading God's word? When was the last time you read, read God's word? And you might hear responses such as, well, I haven't read it this week. I often go days without reading. Actually, this month, I don't think I've opened God's word at all. Or... You could do another scary task. You could ask people, when, were the last, when was the last time you witnessed, you evangelized to someone, you shared the gospel with someone, you're surrounded with people every day. When was the last time you talked to someone about Christ? What would the answer be? You see, we're called to meditate on God's word day and night. We often don't do that. We're called to share the gospel and to bear witness. We're Christ's ambassadors. We have the medicine for a, di for a dying world. And yet we don't share Christian apathy, Christian apathy and indifference. And for us, everything seems to become more important than living for Christ, living in light of his return. Let me give you an example. What if I had the ability to say to you, give you two options tonight? The first option is right now, right now in this moment, Jesus could come back. You could have Jesus come back right now. Or your second option is Christ can come back in 12 months. You can either have Christ come back right now in this moment or you could have him come back in 12 months. What would you answer? What would your response be? Think about it just for a moment. What would you do? What would your heart want? You see, for some... You have too much to do, too much to achieve. There's so many th other things before your eyes at the moment that you want to accomplish. Too much to enjoy and experience. So many plans that you have that aren't yet fulfilled. 
It's a distraction there. What about for others? Some of you might say to that scenario, yes, yes, I want him back now. I'm awake. I'm looking forward to him. I can say with the Apostle John at the end of Revelation, Lord Jesus, come. Yes, come, Lord Jesus. I'm ready. I've been waiting. I've been watching. I've been looking and longing for this day. Paul urges Christians to wake up. The imagery is very vivid here, isn't it? The image is of the alarm clock having already gone off. When the alarm clock goes off, it's time to get ready. It's time to get out of bed. You need to make your appointment. You need to get to school. You need to get to work. The alarm clock has gone off and it's ringing. It's time to get ready. This is the imagery here that Paul is giving. So keep that in mind. Spiritually, Paul is saying the alarm has already gone off. It's already time for you to be awake. You should already be getting up. Christian, why are you still in bed? Why are you still in your pajamas? Christ is coming back. What are you doing? It's time to meet him. And the challenge really here is, do you intend to live your Christian life sleeping like this? Just to sleep through it? To just endure through it in a, in a kind of coma-like sense. You see, the Christian, the danger that Christians face, uh, that Christians face in Paul's time, is the same that we face today. It's apathy. It is apathy and indifference. So, Paul is really telling the Christian here: it's time to make your life count. It's time to use the window of opportunity that's been given. It's time to really get serious, to make the most of this. And and almost I can appeal to you with Elijah when he says, choose this day whom you will serve. It's time to get serious. It's time to make the decision. What am I going to do with this life? Am I going to keep it for myself or am I going to live for Christ? We need to act upon it as if Christ is coming back. See, there are lost souls who are heading headlong into hell, even as we do this recording now. There are believers who are desperately in need of fellowship, encouragement, and help. It's time for you to act now. And we are often so weak, so it's time to be praying and seeking God for help, for power from on high. I came across a a uh, old poem by a Christian, and the theme is on thinking uh, whether or not we will have regret when Christ comes back. Let me quote the poem. It says this, When I stand at the judgment seat of Christ, and he shows me his plan for me, the plan of my life as it might have been, and I see how I blocked him here, and I checked him there, and would not yield my will, Will there be grief in my Savior's eyes? Grief, though he loves me still? He would have me rich, but I stand there poor, stripped of all but his grace, while memory runs like a haunted thing down a path I can't retrace. Then my desolate heart will well nigh break with tears I cannot shed. I will cover my face with my empty hands. I will bow my uncrowned head. O Lord, of the years that are left to me, I give them to thy hand. Take me and break me and mold me to the pattern that thou hast planned. Will there be regret? Will there be great regret that comes over us when Christ comes back and catches us off of God? Now the motivation that we have to wake up and get serious is actually glorious. Look what he says in verse 11. Our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. This is great motivation. We are very close. You are closer to Christ coming back for you. You're closer to heaven than when you were first converted and saved. Heaven is closer today than yesterday. And this, all the beautiful things that this entails, all the wonderful promises. When he comes back, you'll be rid of your sinful nature. When he comes back, trials and suffering will be finished because your faith will be made perfect. When he comes back, your faith will be turned to sight. When he comes back, everything will be made new. He's saying here that the new Jerusalem is in touching distance. 
We are so close. Salvation is close. And he will soon take you into his arms. And you shall see God. And you shall live with God. How's that motivation? It's nearer now than when we first believed. We are really close. Out of every person in history, out of every generation in history, we here are the closest to Jesus' return. Out of anyone who's ever lived before, we are the closest. What a wonderful thought, and Paul urges us with this. So firstly, he's told us that we need to wake up as Christians. And secondly, we see the need to remove old clothing. The need to remove old clothing. Look at verse 12. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness. See, the imagery here is that the night is nearly over. The day is coming. The day is almost here. It's a, it's a wonderful picture that he presents. Nighttime is nearly over. What's nighttime? Nighttime is the present time. Nighttime is the era that we live in. Night also refers to the era and the period of sin and darkness and rebellion and ungodliness, the era of unrighteousness. But night also, the night coming to an end also refers to the time given to mankind. That is almost running out. This period of grace and mercy where salvation is offered for people, for people to be saved, reconciled and forgiven. That period is almost over. The age and period of the gospel going out to people, it's nearly over. Time that has been given to mankind is running out. It's running out. I remember uh, on, on my honeymoon, we went up a... Uh, my wife and I went up uh, one of the largest mountains in Maui, and we went there very, very early, the, the early, early hours of the morning, and the point was to get to the top and to watch the sunrise from this uh, glorious view. And so we got there, it was freezing, it was early, it was dark, we were waiting for ages, and as we're waiting and we're looking at the horizon over all the mountain peaks and the valleys, we're really high up, we're waiting and we're waiting and then we're waiting. And then in a split second, in a moment, this warm light came up and started filling up the valley. In a split second, it went from almost pitch black to warm light. If you blinked, you, you would have missed it. It was incredible. Paul's using that imagery. The night is almost over. The day is, is nearly here. He's saying we are living in that split second moment. If you blink, you'll miss it. The darkness is just about to pass and the dawn is coming. The light is coming. And so he is saying here, humanity's time is running out. Unbelievers, their time is running out. But for the Christians, our time is running out of opportunity, of, of being resourceful, of being useful, of using our talents, of using what God's given to us. It's running out. And so he's saying, do you understand the, the present time? What is Paul's instruction for Christians uh, with Jesus' imminent return? First, he told us to wake up from apathy. Here he's telling us, verse 12, look, let us put aside the deeds of darkness. Put aside the deeds of darkness. The Greek word there is to discard, to remove, to take off, to cast off. The imagery is of removing dirty clothes or putting them away. Now, the context is helpful here. Because in ancient, uh, in ancient East, clothing was significant. Clothing really distinguished a person back then. You could tell a lot about a person by their clothing. And the Bible picks up on this kind of context and, and very cleverly intertwines this with important teaching. So the Bible actually uses uh, the imagery of clothing to describe character qualities. Uh, moral behavior, whether good or evil, is described as clothing. Let me give you some examples. Job says this, I put on righteousness as a robe. So the righteous, righteous living is compared to a robe that one puts on. Isaiah, when he speaks of and prophesies of the Messiah, he says this, he put on the garments of vengeance and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. Peter picks up this 
uh, using clothing as a metaphor in the New Testament. He says to Christians, all of you clothe yourselves with humility. Paul picks up this on a number of occasions in Ephesians 6. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Put on the belt of truth. This clothing to refer to moral behavior or qualities or characteristics. But here Paul firstly uses the imagery and metaphor of clothing to refer to immoral behavior. Look at verse 13. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. So in verse 12, he tells us, put off the deeds of darkness, take them off, get changed, get rid of them. And here in verse 13, he lists some of these moral behaviors that we need to get rid of, these sinful practices that we need to take off. Now, verse 13 is a sample list, obviously. It's not an exhaustive list um, of sins and behaviors that we need to get rid of. But what's interesting on the, uh, with the list is that it focuses on sexual sins, uh, inappropriate sexual behavior, drunkenness, being intoxicated, and unrestrained indulgence. Now, the reason why he particularly, why I think he chooses these particular sins and leaves many out is because his theme has been uh, night, that we are living in the time of the night. We are uh, living in this era, era of night. And he tells us to put off the deeds of darkness. Now these sins of sexual misbehavior and, and drunkenness and all unrestrained indulgence, these are common sins that occur at night time. So he's picking up this imagery here. He's talking about drunken sex parties. He's talking about being intoxicated with too much alcohol, excess living. But you might not be doing any of those things, but these words that he uses here are so interesting. They have a broader application too. They can refer also to lesser, not as wild sins. Sexual immorality can be referring to pornography, pornography use. It can refer to homosexual behavior. It can refer to sex outside of marriage, outside of the marriage bed. It can refer to masturbation. It can refer to all sorts of sexual, uh, sexually inappropriate behavior. And here where he talks about drunkenness, he's talking about intoxication, clouding your mind, drowning out life, drowning out worries, drowning out things with alcohol. And dissension and jealousy, they're not wild sins. The sin of gossip and slander, of coveting what other people have, coveting what they are, bitterness and resentment that flow from that. You see, all of this sin, this characterizes the world, the, the love for pleasure of entertainment and indulgence. This characterizes the world, but the Christians are in danger of being enticed to these sins. We are in danger. And so Paul says, put it aside, cast it off, get rid of it. And, and really, he's appealing to Christians. Jesus is coming back soon. He's on the way. It's not fitting to live this way. Get rid of all of it. We are children of the light, not children of the night. God saved us to free us from such things. Jesus died to pay the penalty and pay for these sins that we used to live in. Now get rid of it, he says. Don't live in it. So we've seen the call to wake up in light of Christ's return. We've seen the call to remove the old clothing that used to characterize us when we're unbelievers in light of Christ's return now. And, and lastly, we, the next we see here is the Christian's dress code. Uh, the Christian's dress code. Look at the second half of verse 12. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. See, you get that undressing and dressing imagery of clothing here. He said, put off the deeds of darkness. Now put on. These are the clothes that you need to wear. And he says, the armor of light. Now, it's interesting use there because in Ephesians chapter 6, he calls it the armor of God. Here he calls it the armor of light. Why? Because remember, he's picking up this imagery of we are in the period of night. Get rid of deeds of darkness. And the opposite of the night, the opposite of, of, of evil and dark deeds is light. Day is coming. Night is nearly over. So, so what then is this armor of light that we need to put on? 
Well, if the deeds of darkness are sin, rebellion, ungodliness, and unrighteousness, well, then the armor of light is righteous living, holiness, godliness, purity, in thought, deed, and speech, in doing good. Light represents holiness and purity. Light represents righteousness. See, to put on light is to reflect God himself. It is to reflect God. That is what it is to put on light. Let me share a few verses. This is what God is characterized. 1 John 1, 5. And this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. James 1.17, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of heavenly lights. Psalm 27.1, the Lord is my light and my salvation. And so the, the imagery here is, is, very, is very striking. Paul's saying, what is the only appropriate clothing for Christians to wear in light of Christ's imminent return? Armour. Armor, armor of light. What does this tell us? We are in a war. We are in a war. We are in a war against Satan. He really wants to stop you from making it to heaven. He wants to ensure that you are an ineffective Christian as well. We are in a war against the world. The world wants to keep you tethered here so that you are not looking to heaven, that you are not living in light of heaven. It is to deceive you, to blind you with things that sparkle in this life. We are in a war against the world and we are in a war against our own sinful nature. Our sinful nature still well up and they want to feed on some of the sins that we used to indulge in and that we used to live in. And it surfaces sometimes seeking to pull us back to the mud that Christ has pulled us out of. Paul says, wake up, disregard the old clothing and put on the armor of light. Reflect God, he's saying, this is war. This is war. Paul has told us that our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. What is he saying? It's just another way of saying, put on the helmet of the hope of salvation. Your salvation is near. Dress up with the helmet of the hope of salvation. Don't look here. Look to the life to come. We need to grasp this. Do we see how important this is? When the world sees us, when God sees us, when the world sees us, they should see a Christian soldier geared up, all dressed up, all armored up, holy living, pure living, Christ-like living, not entangling themselves in the world with the rest of mankind, reflecting God, the very light of God. So I ask you, when the world looks at you, what do they see? When God looks down at you, what does he see? Does he see a reflection of his own light, even albeit imperfectly? But does he see a reflection of his own light? Or does he see someone asleep in their party clothes, in their pajamas, not taking it seriously? Do they see another face in the crowd? This is a real challenge for Christians. Well, Paul has said more than enough regarding the Christian's dress code for the second coming, but he brings it all to a climax here. He said more than enough, but he leaves the most important clothing for the Christian. He leaves it to verse 14. Have a look. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. Literally in the Greek, put on Jesus. Clothe yourself with Jesus. Wear Jesus, he says. Now, now, what, what does that even mean? What, what does that phrase look like? Well, Paul uses this phrase in the New Testament in two different ways. One way he uses it is as a statement of our position before God. And another way he uses it is as a command for Christians to obey. 
Let me show you the first way of our position. In Galatians 3, 26 to 27, look how Paul uses it. He says this, You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. What's he saying here? It, when a person becomes a Christian, at the moment of their conversion, when they are first saved, they are united to Christ and that person puts on Jesus. They are in that moment clothed with Jesus Christ. Prior to their salvation, they were under Adam. They were united to Adam. Adam was their representative head and they were bearing guilt. They were guilty before God and they were already condemned in God's sight. But the moment a person is born again, the moment they become a Christian, they're united to Christ and they are declared righteous by God. God no longer sees that the Christian as guilty, but when he looks at them, they are covered by the righteousness of Christ. And positionally before him, though they will still sin, positionally before him, they are perfect. They're not guilty anymore. They are righteous because they have put on Christ. They are covered by Christ positionally but here in Romans 13 14 that's not what Paul's talking about here Paul isn't referring to our conversion or the moment we're justified before God he's referring to our sanctification how we live and grow as a Christian now that we have already had Christ put on us putting on Christ or clothing ourselves with Christ is the Christian's ongoing duty let me quote John MacArthur here I think he says it very well Quote, he says this, When God looks at you, he sees you clothed in the righteousness of Christ. But God would like it that everybody else who looks at you also sees you clothed in the righteousness of Christ. God can see you clothed in the righteousness of Christ because that's your standing before him. The only way the world will ever see you clothed with the righteousness of Christ is when it's visible in your character. So you have a garment that is visible to God and invisible to the world. And God would like you to put on a visible garment that the world can see to go along with the visible one that he can see. You are to become before men what you are before God. You are to, to so live that the world sees you the way God sees you. God sees you positionally perfectly in Christ. Now you need to live as though you are, you are full of the righteousness of Christ. You need to live as though Christ is in you and upon you. You need to live in a way that the world sees Christ. Let me give three ways that we are to put on Christ and then briefly why it's so vital. What does it look like? Three ways of how we clothe ourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. Firstly, it is to grow in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, to grow in the knowledge. 2 Peter 3.18 says this, Be on guard so you will not fall from your secure standing. Grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't put on what you do not know. How can a person clothe himself with Christ if they know nothing, next to nothing about him, so little of him? How do, we, how do we do this? We need to grow in our knowledge of him. We need to search the scriptures, constantly seeing him in scripture. In the Old Testament, we need to see him as the one who is prophesied about. The one that we see um, prophesied, his ministry, who he is, what he will come to do, what he will accomplish. We need to search the Old Testament to know him. We need to study him in the Gospels as we see him incarnate, revealed as a son of God made flesh. We need to see his ministry, his character revealed in the Gospels, his teaching, his instruction. His death, his resurrection, his ascension. We need to study Christ in the Gospels. We need to study him in the epistles. They teach us about Christ's nature. They teach us about Christ's doctrine, about Christ's commands, how we to live and obey him, how we to reflect him in this world. And we need to study him in Revelation, the one who is prophesied to come, what he will do when he comes back, his mission, his great revelation to the world. We need to study him carefully. This is how we grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is how we clothe ourselves with Christ. Secondly, we clothe ourselves with Christ by imitating him. By imitating him. It's interesting 
for those who would become the new king in Persia back in the day, during their coronation service, during their ordination service, as it were, for the new king of Persia, they would wear the robe that the first Cyrus, the first king of Persia, wore before he became king. Now, why would they be required to, to wear that during their coronation service? Because it was to remind them to imitate the life and legacy of the first Cyrus. That's, that's the point. Now, this is, this is what we're supposed to do. We are supposed to imitate Christ. And not only is this a suggestion, it's commanded in Scripture. Jesus himself said in John 13, 15, I have set you in an example so you should do as I have done for you. Do likewise. 1 John 2, 6, the one who says he remains in Jesus should walk just as he walked. Now, we can only imitate him. We can only be like him if we are carefully studying him, if we are regularly spending time with him, if we are constantly beholding Christ. Now, when I was a kid, me and my brother, we used to watch everything Michael Jordan. We studied him thoroughly to be like him. If you want to be a motivational speaker, motivational speakers study Tony Robbins. Art students study Van Gogh. Writers read Dickens. All of this, imitating and studying who we want to be like. It requires a lot of study. Musicians, they'll keep their favorite artists on their playlists. And do we expect anything less if we seek to reflect and be like Christ? He needs to always be before our eyes, always in our ears, always in our minds, if we are to imitate him. You see, there is a kind of Christian teaching today that says the Christian life, the Christian journey after, after you are saved, is all about just learning to rest in what Jesus has done on the cross. Now, now there is a real element of truth to that. That we need to rest. We need to, we need to trust in what he has done and continually rely on that. We are always in danger of trying to fall into salvation by works, trying to merit grace. We are always in danger of that. But, and, but the teaching really seeks to push forward that once you believe, it's all about falling back and just resting on Jesus, letting go and letting Jesus. That's not, that's not the Christian instruction. When we're saved, we have been positionally uh, having put Christ on. But now as Christians, we are to continually put Christ on. We are to continually imitate him. We are to continue to strive to be like him. We are to continually be cultivating fellowship with him. We are to be like him. We are to put him on daily, not just sit back and just think about what he did on the cross. That is to be our fuel for imitating and wearing him daily. So as we imitate him, look at his character that we read of, his love for sinners and his love for his disciples. We are to imitate his gentleness. He was meek and lowly. We are to imitate his zeal and passion for God, his obedience and submission to God. And we are to imitate his righteousness, holy living, and we're to imitate his compassion, mercy, and forgiveness. This is imitating him is to clothe ourselves with Christ. And also, uh, thirdly, it is to yield to the lordship of Jesus over you. This is to have Christ directing and guiding us, having control over our lives. To take him as Lord, to, to wear him as Lord is to deny ourselves and follow him. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ in me. You see, having such communion, regular daily fellowship with Christ, is when you do that, you emerge from his presence more like him and less like you. Him controlling the way. But this requires prayer and communion and time with him, devotion to him. Now, why, why is this so important? 
as we said before, because Christians are so, all of us are so prone to apathy and indifference. And sometimes we, we, we function, we, we let our Christian life and journey be simply relying on our past experiences with God. Oh, when I, when I was first saved, I enjoyed his presence so much. When I was first saved, I used to read his words so much and pray so much. And what are we doing? We are relying on yesterday's manner. We need to gather manna for today. We need to feed on him today. We can't rely on what was sufficient for yesterday. We need to seek him and put him on daily. This is what we are called to. See in verse 14, he said, Do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Rather, clothe yourself with Christ. We need to be enjoying a new freshness, the the freshness of Christ's presence and his fellowship daily in our lives. We need to be cultivating our relationship with him, enjoying and delighting ourselves in him. And when we put on Christ daily, when we clothe ourselves with him, this will strengthen our fight against sin. When we're wearing Christ, it will help our battle against sin. Think about it like this. Women, if you are wearing your finest dress, your most expensive dress, you are not going to be on your knees in the, in the garden weeding. If you're in your finest, most expensive dress, you are not going to be doing art and craft with the kids. Men, if you are in your best suit, in your finest tux, you are not going to be washing your car. In the same way, if we are wearing Christ, putting on Christ, we are not going to be doing the deeds of darkness. When we have the armor of light on, when we have the light of the world on, we are not going to be living dark, deceitful, evil lives. We won't. How are you going to look at porn when you know Christ is with you? How are you going to slander and gossip and fight when you have Christ on you, when you're wearing him? You can't do that. And so, my clothes... We need to understand the present time. Christ is coming back. And so I ask you, what does the world see? What does God see when he looks at you? Does he see a sleeping Christian? Does he see someone who is ineffective and indifferent in a, in a spiritual coma? Or does he see someone awake? Does he see someone who's taken off the old clothes and has dressed themselves with Christ, ready for his return? What does God see? Let me pray. Our Father, we uh, thank you for these precious words from Paul in the scriptures reminding us that Christ is coming back and he's coming back soon. And these words aren't so much for unbelievers. Uh, They desperately need forgiveness. They desperately need to be washed. They desperately need to be forgiven and have your anger turned away from them. But these words, they are all the more striking because they come to us who are Christian, to, to us who have believed in Christ, who've received the wonderful gift of forgiveness. And it's, and it's shocking to us that we need to be commanded to wake up, to get rid of sinful behavior and to put on Christ It's almost a rebuke to us, Lord, that we need to be reminded of these things. Forgive us when we've been so earthly bound that we forget and we disregard and don't even look forward to Jesus coming back. I pray for each of us that we would be prepared, that we would live in light of his return, that we won't be caught off guard and that we won't be ashamed when Christ comes back to judge the world. May you pour out your grace on each person listening. Even now we pray. And all of this in the name of your Son, our Lord. Amen. May the Lord bless uh, each and every one of you.